Boomerang Bill by Jack Boyle In San Francisco's Plymouth Square, east and west rub shoulders on a thumbnail patch of neutral territory that, racially, is no man's land. Above the tiny park, within a block, lies Chinatown, a transplanted bit of the Orient, an alien city of queer, pungent odors, of slippered feet that move soundlessly, of shy, yellow faces that peer furtively from the high windows, barred and curtained, a city that exhales an atmosphere of mystery, well kept from the white man's eyes. Below Plymouth Square, and within a block of it, lies Kearney Street, the Occidental, a busy thoroughfare, a hum with the turmoil of the white man's business, done in the white man's way. But in Plymouth Square, east and west meet and mingle on the benches that line the graveled walks, and exchange curious, half-suspicious glances. Into the park, from the Oriental's domain, came a white man, or what once had been a white man. Shabby clothes flapped grotesquely about his shriveled body. The contaminating mark of the East betrayed itself in his shuffling gait, and in the waxy pallor of his face and in his eyes, which were those of a man who had slipped grievously on life's road, and then by chance found a compensating substitute for all that the world holds good and worthwhile. From a strap across his shoulders hung a tray filled with shoelaces, pencils, and the trashy wares of the street peddler, become more than half merchant. At his side trudged a child, a tiny Chinese girl, who clung to his hand and looked into his face with hero-worshipping eyes set aslant as she clattered volubly in the jargon of her race. At the heels of the two followed a black and yellow mongrel dog, which looked up at them now and then, always with loving, hero-worshipping eyes, and would have chattered too, if it could. "'Boomerang Bill!' exclaimed a well-dressed youth, nudging the arm of Boston Blackie who sat beside him on the park bench. "'Poor broken-down old bum, peddling pencils for a jitney a-throw. I hear he lives in I.U.'s old den, in the alley along with the chink's little girl and the yellow dog since the old man died. Bill looks like he's turned half chink himself, doesn't he? They say he was once a real crook. Lord, they must have broke his nerve right over at Quentin Prison to have brought him to this. Did you know him in the old days when he was all white, Blackie? Did I know him? As Boston Blackie repeated the question, Reel after reel of swiftly moving pictures unfolded before him. The characters in them lived and moved, and spoke again as once, in reality, they had lived, moved, spoken, and loved. And this is the resurrected drama of the past that was relived in Boston Blackie's memory as he paused after the question. Boomerang Bill's social debut in San Francisco was superlatively auspicious or supremely unfortunate according to the viewpoint but none could deny that it was spectacular a stranger in town he was sauntering along hay street one evening during that bygone period of the city's history when bright lights burned brightest just before sun-up and prohibition was a mythical killjoy bill was lonely a stranger in an unfriendly land, longing for familiar faces and squalid turmoil of New York's east side, from which he was in exile. The melancholy wanderer's nostalgia was interrupted by strains of dance music, the blatantly syncopated sort of strange to which he was used on Saturday nights in his district Tammany Club. Bill's eyes rose longingly to the second-story windows of the dance hall, ablaze with lights and gay with cotton bunting. Below the hall was a saloon. That, too, suggested home to Bill. Over the doorway was a huge sign on which he read, Hayes Valley Democratic Club. I'm a Tammany Democrat, 
and all democrats east or west are brothers i'll step inside and give me frisco pals and their girls the double o decided bill he bought a ticket climbed the stairs entered the hall and found himself at once the object of two hundred pairs of curious eyes sixty seconds convinced boomerang bill of the utter fallacy of his theory of the universal brotherhood of democrats unconcealed hostility innate as a dog's at first sight of a canine stranger met bill's gaze from two score masculine eyes as he slowly and nonchalantly surveyed the room a box barrage of quick half shielded feminine glances betrayed excited interest wonder and suppressed admiration for the bold stranger who had appeared uninvited and unexplained in the stronghold of larry mcquade's boo gang besides bill was good to look upon thick of chest heavy of hand and bold and unfearing of eye he was one in whom each feminine appraiser in the room recognized a potential knight whose chosen steed would never lack a protecting fist when one was needed bill read the divided verdict he faced as clearly as if it had been spoken his spirits rose and unobtrusively he tightened his belt not seeking trouble he was nevertheless prepared for it for the first time since he had become an exile from the east side he felt at home the dance came to an end and then instantly a pair of provocative black eyes precipitated the inevitable battle gave bill his name and won him lasting hayes valley celebrity naturally the eyes were those of a girl with deliberate purpose she smiled at bill as her partner seated her on the bench encircling the hall all the perverse impishness of a born mischief-maker lay behind that smile bill smiled back but made no move the girl's scowling courtier asked for the next dance i've promised it she answered loud enough for bill to overhear and again her two red lips parted alluringly in the direction of his corner the music began leaving her the one girl in the hall not dancing once again she looked toward bill and the look was both an invitation and a challenge i dare you it said bill accepted the challenge without illusions he was not anxious to fight and even less anxious to dance but a dare is a dare and the reputation of the east side rested on his shoulders may i have the pleasure he mumbled perfunctorily crossing over to the side of the temptress with a mocking smile towards her enraged escort the girl slipped into bill's arms and then began the dance which led by a long and devious trail to old i use den in chinatown bill was a gruff and ungracious partner he knew that the last strains of the music meant instant battle without quarter in which he would be one against a hundred man after man bumped into bill who returned bump for bump imperturbably as his eyes roamed the hall and appraised its strategic possibilities for the unequal conflict to follow at last in a corner near the stairway he found what he sought the music stopped the girls flocked precipitately to far corners of the hall bill escorted his partner to her seat thanks for the chance to do to your man what he ought to do to you he said and backed into the corner near the doorway from which he faced a narrowing circle of boo gang warriors the swarthy youth whose proprietary rights to the black-eyed enchantress had been so wantonly ignored crossed to the corner where bill lounged seemingly at ease why don't you learn to step before you ask a lady on the floor you big hick he demanded the crowd behind him edged forward shutting off escape by the stairway bill eyed his antagonist calmly and with mock surprise step me 
This is the way the Tammany Democrats step in little old New York. With the speed of a striking python, Bill's right hand shot out as he spoke and caught the challenger by the throat in a vice-like grip. The crowd surged toward him. With his left hand, he reached behind him and turned off the electric light switch. Then, bedlam. Cries, groans, and curses intermingled. One of the big front windows crashed to bits as a man was hurled bodily through it. He struck the first floor awning and bounced off to the sidewalk. In the hall, the combat raged furiously. The advantage lay with Bill, notwithstanding the odds against him, for in darkness, where he had no friends, he could strike free-handed without fear of hitting one. The rest were handicapped by the necessity of locating the one enemy among a hundred allies. Finally, someone found the electric switch, and the hall again was flooded with light. It revealed the Hayes Valley Democratic Club dance as a gory spectacle. Half a dozen men were on the floor. A dozen others were mopping bleeding lips and eyes already discolored by the dark hues of defeat. Bill was gone. He's beat it, the lucky stiff, cried someone, as the uninjured helped the casualties to tottering feet. Where's Tony the Wop? demanded another of the groaning and maimed fighters. His girl started this bus. That new guy throwed him through the window, clean through into the street, answered an excited feminine voice. A bruised and badly disheveled Tony staggered up the stairs. In an instant, the dark-eyed one, whose faithlessness had furnished the causa belli, was at his side, whispering soothing endearments as she gave first aid to his wounds, with the skill that bespoke previous experience. Some scrapper, that bird, suggested one whose collar was missing and whose coat hung in tatters about his waist. He packs a Jim Jeffers in both coat sleeves, I'll say. And I'll say I'll get him, and get him right, if he stays in Frisco, added Tony the Wop. The excited babble of voices died out suddenly. All eyes turned toward the doorway. In it stood Bill, disheveled, but his eyes aglow with the joyous battle light. Here I am, he challenged. Who's next? I'm Fifty Street Bill of the Smoky Hogan Gang from New York. Any gent that's curious about the rest of me history can step up and get it gratis. The effrontery of the lone stranger's reappearance stunned the crowd into inaction. No one moved. Once, twice, Bill's eyes ranged the hushed circle he faced. Then, with a smile of conscious victory, he slowly backed down the stairway. Still bathing the battered face of Tony the Wop, the dark-eyed girl smiled again over her shoulder with wanton mischief into the face of the slowly retreating gladiator. They never saw each other again. The Boo Gang stalwarts appreciated valor, even in an enemy. Fiftieth Street Bill, ejaculated one in frank admiration. That ain't no name for that guy. The harder you hit him, the quicker he comes back. Boomerang Bill had ought to be his name. Thenceforth, Fiftieth Street Bill of New York became Boomerang Bill of San Francisco. What fates three capricious spinners began at the Hayes Valley Club dance through the aid of a tantalizing pair of black eyes, they continued just in front of Sam's place, Quick Eats, with the aid of a damp match and an unlit cigar. Within a week of Boomerang Bill's tempestuous evening with his Democratic brothers, he found himself heartily tired of San Francisco and longing only as much as he could long for the familiar haunts and faces of the east side streets that were home to him it was while he was dining solitary and lugubrious in sam's place that he decided a return to the tenement blocks of his dreams was worth its risk i'll grab a rattler tonight he decided thrilling with the joy of immediate action if them pinkertons still want to pin me let em 
I'll take me chances and I'll pack my keister and blow. This burg ought to be decorated with crepe. Bill finished his dinner hurriedly, bought a cigar as he paid his check, and stepped into the street, unconsciously humming Tammany's rallying song. Then he produced his last match, a damp one, to light his cigar. The match fizzed, sputtered, but failed to ignite. He turned back into the restaurant for another one, walked over to the tiny cage behind whose brass railings the restaurant cashier sat. Slip me a bit of fire, will you? As he looked up, quick perception stifled the carelessly familiar kiddo which had been on his lips. Within a minute, the buxom Venus of the day shift to whom he had paid his check had disappeared. In her place was a girl whose gray-blue eyes, looking into his interrogatively, reminded him, though he did not know why, of the quaint old Irish fairy tale of helpless and lovely princesses with which he had been valiantly thrilled at his mother's knee. Slender and dainty and elfin, she seemed to him all a princess should be. "'You wanted?' she asked. A match, please, if you don't mind, miss, stammered Boomerang Bill. She handed him a box and went on ringing up checks and making change. Boomerang Bill returned to his hotel and paid another week's room rent. He didn't even remember that he had intended to start forthwith for New York. That night he dreamed a fairy tale in which an elfin princess with gray-blue eyes cried out to him to rescue her from a man-dragon with the face of Tony the Wop. As he lounged about his room the next day, restless and dissatisfied, Boomerang Bill was frankly amazed at himself. He had made rough love to many girls of many kinds, but he prided himself on invulnerability against feminine wiles. But now, with an elfin face and the luring appeal of a pair of gray-blue eyes suddenly altering the course of his life, he found a new longing gradually taking definite form in the background of his imagination. It was for a cottage, vine-covered, with a tiny garden, gay colored with blossoming flowers, while in the doorway there waited, for him, that someone so manifestly misplaced in the cashier's cage of Sam's place, Quick Eats. Boomerang Bill scowled angrily into his mirror. I must be getting nutty, he ejaculated. She is no girl for a crook. She wasn't, which, to those who can understand, explains why Bill, lifelong denizen of tenement slums, for the first time in his life, envisioned a vine-covered cottage, and wondered how some men managed to earn an honest living. The truth is, though, that he would have denied it belligerently, that Boomerang Bill was a gangster and a hold-up man only because he had had but small chance to be anything else. Somewhere deep in his slum-dwarfed nature lay the hitherto dormant impulses of a homemaker and a home-lover, which had descended to him from ancestors who had loved and fought for their thatched cottages on the edge of Irish peat bogs. Cottages poor in architecture, but rich in the wealth of barefoot babies that played about their doors. Without in the least understanding, Bill felt this instinctive call with surprised exasperation. That dame's getting on my nerves, he complained crossly. I'll stay away from that eating house joint of hers. Having satisfied himself with this resolve, he went for a long walk, which ended in front of Sam's place at the precise moment at which the girl with the elfin face and strangely appealing eyes appeared in the cashier's cage. At once Bill realized he was hungry. He went in for his dinner. Two nights later, Annabel May returned from her work shortly after midnight to find her mother waiting for her, as usual, in the least bare of their two light housekeeping rooms. There was a new expression on the girl's face on this night, 
an expression that reflected a mind divided between troubled concern and welcome expectancy. "'What's worrying you, daughter?' the wan face of her mother asked. "'I was wondering,' the girl replied, and paused. Then, "'A man followed me home last night and again tonight. He keeps on the opposite side of the street, but I know he follows me. He's the one, I think, who eats at the restaurant twice an evening and looks at me so strangely each time he pays his checks. "'You must call a policeman, mother, in alarm. "'No, no, you misunderstand. He never looks at me like that,' the daughter contradicted. "'That's why I wondered.' "'Wondered what, child?' "'Why he follows me at all.' Being unable, or possibly unwilling, to answer her own question, and finding herself persistently followed each evening, Annabel May convinced herself that propriety, secretly abetted by curiosity, required that she ask it of Boomerang Bill himself. Crossing the street suddenly one night, as he followed on the opposite sidewalk, the girl faced Bill beneath the flare of a corner drugstore's lights. She had chosen the spot strategically, for with womanly intuition she wished to look into his face as she asked her question surprised in the midst of a wide-awake dream in which he was buying furniture with lordly prodigality for the vine-covered cottage boomerang bill awkwardly dragged off his hat and stood before her as shamefacedly as a schoolboy interrupted in the act of writing his first love poem on a slate why do you follow me home every evening demanded annabel may with a defensive hostility that is a woman's natural armor under the fixed stare of her eyes which never left his face boomerang bill was as helpless as a baby he stammered reddened until his face matched the fiery color of his hair then wisely told the truth because because i wanted that is i didn't want floundering hopelessly the gunman dragged himself back to coherency with a mighty effort. A bunch of those boo gang boys hang out around these corners, and I wanted to be close up in case any of them ever tried to get fresh when you're going home alone. As he explained, his big fist clenched unconsciously. Looking into his eyes, the girl's doubts, they had never been more than tiny ones, were removed. The rigid hostility of her face softened and vanished. It was just what she had hoped to hear. For a hundred and eighty pounds of belligerently protective and reverentially respectful masculinity is the one sure remedy for the trying defenselessness that tests the courage of unsheltered girls like Annabel May. She smiled up at him, ingeniously delighted. That's just what I hoped you would say she exclaimed with a happy thoughtfulness and then realizing the extent of this admission she turned hurriedly and recrossed the street with boomerang bill by her side they were before her door before either was aware of it good night said the girl shyly offering her hand good night stammered bill squeezing it between two big but trembling paws had he known how such things were done would have knelt and kissed the little fingers within his as handsome and graceful heroes always did in the old-fashioned melodramas he loved not having the temerity to do this he escaped into the darkness and pressed his own hand at the spot where hers had touched it to his lips to this had a pair of gray-blue eyes so quickly reduced boomerang bill one-time gunman of the new york slums from that night life for boomerang bill was divided into two parts sharply and painfully before four when annabel may took charge of the restaurant cash register he was just a big honest-eyed irish boy who chatted gaily with her tired-faced mother answered the girl's every glance with shy reverential eyes and never guessed that the one easy chair in their shabby rooms was hardly more comfortable than the top of a fire hydrant. On some days, 
the red-letter ones, he and Annabelle May took long jaunts through Golden Gate Park, or to Ocean Beach, where they ate lunch among the rocks, and, hand in hand, built queer make-believe houses in the sand, like the carefree children they were, for the moment. During these hours, Boomerang Bill the gunman simply did not exist. And then, at four, when he surrendered his comrade to the cashier's cage at Sam's place, life, with all its sordid necessities, surged over him again, overwhelmingly demolishing the dreams of his better hours as the surf at high tide demolished the abandoned playhouses in the sand. After four, in a word, Bill became again Boomerang Bill, a man exiled with reason from his hometown. As the weeks passed, however, and the daily comradeship with Annabel May became more and more the one insistent demand of his nature, Bill discovered, with growing perplexity, that the pre-four phase of his dual life was subtly overlapping and intermingling with the hitherto easy matter of keeping money in his pockets by the simple east side expedient of finding someone who had it and taking it at the point of a gun muzzle there had been a time when boomerang bill was a skillful and methodically careful worker at the trade chosen for him by his environment street piracy had been a remunerative wholly easy and pleasantly exciting employment he found now with honest perplexity that days with annabel may in which his first vague shadowy dreams of a home gradually assumed form and substance were a poor mental preparation for planning a drugstore hold-up by night when he should have been studying a store's possibilities from the viewpoint of the industrious crook he found his eyes and mind wandering involuntarily to the windows of some nearby furniture store which displayed the complete furnishings of a model four-bedroom apartment priced three hundred dollars pay as you please before he knew it he would find himself window shopping for furniture with a zest that comes once in a lifetime to men and women who are fortunate and never to those who are not also, Bill came to realize with shocked surprise that being a crook, his chiefest pride in the old East Side days, was rapidly becoming his bitterest regret. He hated to live a lie before the frank, credulous, urgently appealing eyes of Annabel May. But to tell her the truth was to lose her. Of that he was sure. He had never feared the power of the law but he did fear mightily the verdict he knew he would read in the girl's eyes if she ever learned the truth. Given time, those eyes would have turned Boomerang Bill from the easy but risky life of a bachelor crook to the harder but safer one of an honest man buying a home on the installment plan. But fate, who, when she chooses, always holds the highest trump, intervened, and did so at the beach all day annabel may had been grave and strangely preoccupied raising himself suddenly from his sandy bed at her side boomerang bill surprised on her face the haunted look of a friendless child confronting a new and terrifying danger annabel what's wrong he cried in quick alarm tell me dear there were tears and beseeching appeals in her eyes as she turned toward him mother she said mother yes the doctor was yes the doctor was at the house again today he left her medication and said her cough will soon be better somehow i felt that he didn't mean it i went to his office before i met you and asked him to tell me the truth he said her lips trembled and she made a gesture of utter poignant hopelessness he said what dearest boomerang bill was unconscious of the endearing term he had never until now dared to venture he said she will die soon if we stay here the hot dry climate of arizona is the only hope both lungs are affected 
Quite as unconsciously as he had called her dearest, Bill drew the girl into his arms, where she lay unresisting, sobbing against his shoulder. To Boomerang Bill, gangster, this was the first and happiest of three great moments he was to know in a lifetime. Poor little girl, poor little sweetheart, he murmured comfortingly, stroking her hair with the big but gentle hand that surprised him by its temerity. You and mother shall start for the desert country at once, he promised her. In a few months she'll be well, I'm sure of it. Don't cry, please, little one. There's nothing to trouble you now. We can't. I may not be able to get work there, and we can't even afford the railway fare. The money? That's easy, Bill contradicted. I'll bring it to you tonight. Bill had forgotten, not that it would have made any difference if he had remembered, that he had changed his last five-dollar gold piece when he paid their fare to the beach. No, you mustn't. I can't let you do that, she protested. For days Boomerang Bill had been painfully muddling his brain in writing and memorizing a stiltedly eloquent proposal, upon which, when he dared, he intended to risk his hopes of happiness. Now, with Annabel May in his arms, he forgot what he had planned to say. Annie, since the night I first saw you, I have loved you and wanted you always. You know that's God truth, he said gently. If you care, if you'll marry me, we'll go to Arizona and make a home for mother and ourselves. Boomerang Bill saw the shell-like color of the girl's cheek deepen. Her hand caught and held his. Boomerang Bill, taking that for his answer, was satisfied. Hours later, when Annabel May was back in her cashier's cage, and Bill was wandering the streets alone, with a happiness so great it awed him, he remembered that his entire supply of money consisted of less than five dollars. I'll turn a trick tonight, a big one, and my last, he promised himself confidently. In Arizona, I'm going to hit the square trail. Whereupon, fate played another high trump. This time, a glance from a vindictive eye of Tony the Wop, who never had forgotten or forgiven the stranger who had humbled his Sicilian pride before the eyes of his lady love. Damn New York Irisher! he muttered vengefully, his wrath flaring into renewed hatred at the sight of the enemy as they passed on the street. How does he get his dough, I wonder? The thought suggested a brilliantly attractive possibility. Tony the Wop began a quick canvas of Hayes Valley Resorts in search of Detective Sergeant Gatelli, his fellow countryman and friend. Boomerang Bill, once more the gunman, turned slowly in the direction of the neighborhood branch bank, which he knew would be open that evening. As he got out his revolver and fashioned a mask in his room that evening, having satisfied himself that the bank in question admirably suited his purpose, Bill realized, with perplexity, that he was as nervous as an amateur. He remembered that their last job, notoriously, is the jinx of all crooks. It won't be mine, he promised himself, and knew as he spoke that his promise was unbacked by conviction. Boomerang Bill's warning premonition apparently belied itself. The hold-up was accomplished with his old-time nerve, precision, and dispatch. It netted him a well-filled sack of gold and currency, more than he required. As Bill drove away in the car he had stolen for his escape, the touch of the coin sack swung beneath his armpit, thrilling him by its nearness, its sureness. It represented his power to give the girl he loved all she so desperately needed. Boomerang Bill was happier than he had believed any man could ever be. No disturbing qualms of conscience ruffled his utter contentment. Before him, and very near, was Annabel May, and a home, and a new life. As he abandoned the car on a side street and started homeward, Boomerang Bill was no longer Bill the experienced hold-up man 
fresh from the robbery of a bank. Had he been, he would have avoided the streets in advance of the inevitable alarm, and hidden the damning evidence of guilt that hung beneath his arm. Also the equally damnable mask and revolver. Instead, following his thoughts, he turned straight toward Sam's place. Happy in anticipation of what he would see in Annabel May's eyes when he slipped the money to her across the counter. Detective Sergeant Gatelli, who had been told but a few hours before by Tony the Wop that Boomerang Bill was worth watching, saw him enter the restaurant. He had just received a description of the bank robber. Bill filled it in every detail. It isn't possible that I can be this lucky. But I'll find out mighty quick, the policeman decided. As the detective entered the restaurant, Bill, standing before the cashier's wicket, was in the act of drawing a sheaf of bills from his pocket. Gatelli tapped him on the shoulder. I want a little talk with you outside, he said. Boomerang Bill's first surprised glance identified Gatelli as a police officer. Without a word or glance of recognition toward the wide-eyed, puzzled girl behind the cash register, Bill turned quickly, even eagerly, into the street, with the detective at his side. The possibilities of escape did not enter his mind. His one all-dominating thought was that he must conceal his acquaintance with Annabel May, that he must protect her from the damning fact that he had been found in the act of sharing bank loot with her. Live around here? questioned the detective. Yes. Working? Not just now. With another perfunctory query on his lips, the detective spied a suspicious bulge beneath Bill's coat and whipped it back, revealing the bank's coin sack. In a second, the detective's gun was at Bill's breast. In another second, handcuffs were on his wrists. Annabel May was troubled and anxious when, for the first time, Bill was missing when she left her work. In the morning papers she found the solution, and Boomerang Bill's picture. "'Oh, how could he?' she cried, horrified. And then, with quick understanding, she added gently, "'It was for me!' Her natural horror at the discovery that the man she was to marry was in prison faded. In its stead, and born of a certainty that his love and her necessity were responsible, she found a new and greater tenderness for Boomerang Bill filled her heart, and irresistibly pleading his cause. Women are like that, sometimes. From his cell in the city prison, Boomerang Bill sent word to the detective chief that he was ready to plead guilty. The evidence against him was overwhelming. The quicker it was all over, the better. On the third day after his first great moment on the beach, Boomerang Bill had been sentenced to ten years in San Quentin Penitentiary. Then Annabel May went to him. As he was led into the jail reception room, she sprang toward him. If I had known, if I had guessed, she whispered brokenly as she clung to his arm, you never would have done it. You were there because of me, because you care. Never, never can I forget that. The sudden joy of great and unexpected happiness lighted Boomerang Bill's face. You don't hate me for what I did, he whispered. Hate you? And looking into her eyes, Bill saw that he had won instead of lost her. You will wait? he asked humbly. I don't ask you to. I haven't the right to ask anything of you now. I haven't the right to hope for anything. But when you come back, you'll find me waiting, the girl interrupted. Nothing and no one shall come between us. Then, if you'll give me now the only promise I shall ever ask of you, life will begin again for both of us. Promise me, dear, you'll never again, even for me, Try to get money you haven't earned honestly. Never again, so help me God. The next day they took him to San Quentin Penitentiary. Each week brought him a letter from Annabel May. He reckoned time by the thickness of the packet he carried always 
in the pocket he'd sewn into the bosom of his prison shirt. Twice a month he answered her letters, answered them in haltingly worded, painfully misspelled epistles that were written straight out of the heart of the one woman man who bared his innermost being on prison stationery for the eyes of the one woman. Boomerang Bill was almost happy during these months, for his mind lightly skipped the numbing monotony of the prison in its fixed intentness upon the future rich with promise. There were fifty of Annabel May's letters in Boomerang Bill's treasure packet on the day when the yard captain's runner silently slipped a pass to the visitor's reception room into his hands, as he worked with a thousand others in the clanking turmoil of the cloth mill. The significance of the slip of paper fell upon him like a blow. Bill had made her promise never to visit the prison, and now she had come, for his visitor, he was sure, could be no one else. In the reception room he found Annabel May. She had come to him with outstretched hands, and a cry of momentary joy that was stifled by the hopelessness of an indefinable something he read in her eyes. As on that other so difficult day at the beach, he asked in alarm, Annabel, what's wrong? And as she had at the beach, the girl answered, Mother! No, not dead! Annabel May shook her head. Not that, not quite that, but I know. The doctor said it will be very soon unless I take her to Arizona at once. Now, she managed to say, I'll... With the half-uttered confident promise of aid on his lips, Boomerang Bill realized what he was and where. His eyes traveled to the guard lounging in the doorway, to the hideous striped clothes he wore to the adamant prison wall just visible outside the windows. Each was a crushing reminder of the bondage in which he lived, and must live for long years. The eager light in his eyes died as he covered his face with unsteady hands. A worthless, blundering, half-witted fool. That's what I am to be here like this when you need me, he cried, revealing the depths of his self-contempt with each word. Annie, I'd give my life for the money you need, but I can't cash it in for a single dollar. Annabel May caught his hand in hers. It isn't your fault, dear, she said. You're in here only because of what you tried to do for me. I'll never forget that, or stop caring for you because of it, but... The girl stopped. Boomerang Bill, sensing new and greater danger, squared his shoulders, as if for a blow. "'You haven't told all. Tell me,' he said. "'I came to tell you, to ask you, ask you if—' Annabel May covered her face. "'Oh, my dearest, I can't, I can't, I won't!' she cried. "'Tell me,' repeated Boomerang Bill. The girl struggled to speak. There's a man I know, a young mining engineer, and they're sending him to Arizona to work, and he wants me to, to, he says he loves me. The girl stopped and hid her face on Boomerang Bill's striped coat. Finish telling me, he repeated. I don't love him, he knows that, but he says I will in time. He wants me to go with him to Arizona and take mother and marry him. I came to tell you. No, you belong to me. You promised to wait. Boomerang Bill caught her by the shoulders with rough fingers that bruised her. His eyes blazed with the inherent fury of a man-animal who sees his true mate threatened by a rival. I know it so, she gasped with scant coherence. Then, fighting for mastery of herself, and of speech. I came to ask you what I must do. You must choose for me. If I go, if I marry him, I break my heart and my promise to you. If I don't, my mother will die, and I will live knowing I killed her. 
I came today to ask you to choose for me. Boomerang Bill made no reply. His face was a dull, death-like gray. Minutes passed, minutes in which his filmed eyes saw the vine-covered cottage with Annabel May in the doorway, and another man turning in at the gate to receive the welcome that was in her eyes. He struck his breast. No, never, he cried. Two tiny hands caught and held his. Their touch killed the fierce, unnameable something that had slipped the words past his lips. You have chosen? I am to say no? the girl asked, her face as white and pained as her lover's. During seconds, each age long, they looked straight into each other's eyes. Then suddenly, Boomerang Bill caught her into his arms, crushing her to his breast as he kissed her hungrily, fiercely. Slowly he released her. Marry him. I've chosen for you, he said. This was the second of the three great moments of Boomerang Bill's life. Three weekly letters, long, loving, devoted letters, had been added to the packet within Boomerang Bill's shirt since the day of his renunciation. Then, in midweek, as he returned to his cell at night, Bill found a fourth, and last. The lines blurred as he read. My dearest, this is goodbye. I must not write again, ever. I know you will understand why I must not. Today I am yours. Tomorrow we start, and I shall have lost the right to be, in heart and soul, your Annie. Boomerang Bill threw himself on his bunk, with Annabel May's last letter crumpled within his fingers. The tomorrow of the letter was now today, her wedding day. Now, this instant, as he lay behind his steel-barred door, Annabel May was another man's wife. During that long night and the others that followed it, he learned for the first time all that imprisonment may mean to a man whose woman is beyond the power of his protection and love. For days and weeks and months, Boomerang Bill existed as nearly without hope as any man may be and live but by slow graduations and because men must rekindle hope or die he began again at last to look forward to the faraway future created by imagination at the command of necessity slowly this fiction of his mind took on a vivid clarity of reality he saw himself a time-expired man, walking out of the prison gates, free. He saw the endless expanse of the southern deserts drift past car windows. He felt the fierce heat rising from Arizona's unshaded plains. Then, as he lay in his cell, with pulse quickened by the thrills of eager anticipation, Boomerang Bill saw himself hurry toward the cottage, meaner, bearer than the vine-covered haven of happiness of which he had once dreamed. In the doorway was a girl, slender and elfin, with gray-blue eyes. Always he was quite close before she recognized him, so close he could see every line of unhappiness in her face. And then, as she knew him, he saw her eyes light suddenly with welcome and love and stretching out trembling arms, she flung herself to him, crying, Thank God! You have come at last! Take me away, somewhere, anywhere with you! Just there, always, the vision ended, and Boomerang Bill turned back his mind like a clock, began again with his exit from the prison gates, and relived the scenes of his hope-conjured visions. And then, one day, so unexpectedly he almost doubted its reality, Boomerang Bill was granted a parole, and actually walked through the great gates of San Quentin Prison, and became once more a free man. Straight, as he seemed to have done it a thousand times in the darkness of his cell, he traveled Arizona-ward, 
He saw the trackless wastes of cactus-filled desert flit by. He felt the radiating heat of the treeless plains as he dropped from the train at the town in which Annabel May had gone. The quick, duskless Arizona night had fallen before he located her cottage. It was more like the vine-covered cottage of his dreams than like the bare, meager one of his prison nights. Light shone from the windows, but there was no waiting girl in the doorway to recognize and welcome him. So accustomed had Bill become to that imagined picture that her absence strangely disturbed him. He crossed the lawn, intending to knock, and then, within a step of the porch, halted suddenly. From within the house he heard gurgling laughter, a little child's laughter. A chill, cold as the night wind, fell upon his heart. A child's laughter had been no part of the conjured vision of his return. Silently he stole around the house and peered in through the window. He saw Annabel May, a far different Annabel May from the one imagination had pictured. She was kneeling beside a cradle in which lay a little girl with her mother's soft flaxen hair, but with eyes not gray-blue, but an alien brown. The fiercely jealous animosity of a defrauded male animal curled Boomerang Bill's lips back from his clenched teeth, and in the first torturing instant of the full understanding he saw, in the brown-eyed prattling child that lay in its mother's arms, something that had robbed him of more than life itself. And then, as she raised her head, he glimpsed Annabel May's face clearly in the full light. It was rounder, fuller, softer than the memory pictured it, and flush with the fulfillment of mother love. Gravel crunched on the walk, and there was a step on the porch. The door was thrown open, and a man stood silhouetted against the outside blackness. Annabel May sprang to her feet with an eager, welcoming cry. "'My darling!' she cried. "'Why are you so terribly late? You know little Annie simply will not go to sleep until you come.' Together they knelt beside the cradle, the man's arm tenderly clasped about Annabel May's waist. Silently, Boomerang Bill stole away in the darkness. That was the third and last and most bitter of the three great moments in Boomerang Bill's lifetime. The shabby peddler with his tray of cheap wares, the little Chinese girl clinging to his hand, the yellow mongrel following close behind, trudged on along the graveled walk of Plymouth Square. Boston Blackie's eyes followed them. Say, did you know Boomerang Bill in the old days when he was a crook, all white and not half chink? repeated the two well-dressed youth at his side, a bit impatient at Blackie's abstract silence. Know him? Yes, I knew Boomerang Bill when he was all white, which he is today, Blackie replied. I knew him when he was a better man than either of us, which he may be today. But he must have a yellow streak, persisted the youth. A prison jolt can't change a white man into that with a jerk of his thumb toward the peddler. "'Prison didn't make Boomerang Bill what he is,' answered Blackie quietly. "'A baby with brown eyes that might have been blue like Bill's own did it. He lost everything that makes life livable, and has found in its stead what you see. A little chink girl he calls Annie, and a yellow dog. They love him, and he lives for them.' and he sells pencils, because once, long ago, he promised a girl he'd never turn another crooked trick. Yes, kid, Boomerang Bill's a man, a man of his word. The End of Boomerang Bill by Jack Boyle